uh, and Manu also already told you that uh, basically what I want to bring you, bring closer to you, uh, what, which, which is dear to my heart, is the bright space photometry or the bright mission uh, uh, overall. I am since 2007 uh, really kind of tied to the hip uh, to that mission and also kind of interleaved into this whole specific mission uh, of Bright. I'll tell you a bit about what the general <clears throat> aspect and challenges are if you want to, uh, you know, create, develop a space mission and operate it and, and, and produce useful data, no matter what kind of application it is. It, it, it is, in fact, uh, whether it is something that relates to astrophysics or planetary physics or the sun, doesn't matter. But let's uh, start with Bright. Uh, the headlines of Bright, uh, top headlines are, Bright is an acronym for, it stands for Bright Target Explorer, Bright. A constellation of six nanosatellites uh, funded uh, and developed by, or funded by three countries, Austria, Canada, Poland. Among those are the first Austrian uh, satellites. Uh, and here on the right side, you see the, the mission patch. Every mission must have a patch, um, that's for sure. <clears throat> and uh, the, 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 the countries were not selected by its uh, you know, flag uh, color, but it just happened to be such a nice fit. Um, Six nanosatellites. Let's start with the satellite classification per se. You may see that all along somewhere in, in, a, in a text or you know on the wiki or somewhere that this and that satellite is a micro, a mini, a small satellite or what. And um, the satellites are classified by, not by size, they are actually classified by mass. And um, if we go back to the nine. 1957, year 1957, the first satellite launched into space, as we all know, was Sputnik, uh, launched by the USSR, was in fact, by this definition that was retroactively kind of set, an, a microsatellite, something between 10 and 100 kilos. The bright satellites uh, are actually falling into a smaller category. It's between one and 10 kilograms. Uh, Hubble is a, just a satellite, I mean, or a large satellite, anything beyond a ton. Uh, in this kind of, you know, picture, you see that, well, no big surprise, if you look at roughly what uh, the categories are here, uh, that mass and to some degree, then size also correlates the cost uh, of the mission. As a, you can expect to be a micro a nanosatellite mission as um, Bright is, which is a more sophisticated one, to cost a few million euros or dollars. And subsequently, if you go to the right, uh, you 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 know the the budget you have to uh, put out or or uh, raise somewhere. Uh, um, gains in strengths a lot or increases a lot, up to a billions of dollars. Uh, there's another um, there's another categorization of satellites that came about 20 years ago when the smaller the smaller branch here to the left was actually started to become more interesting, even for uh, more sophisticated applications, real science that uh, that I want to say uh, you will. Let's see quite often on the term of CubeSats. CubeSats were uh, generated in the early 2000s by a number of groups that uh, essentially <laughs> thought, well, you could do some more or less useful thing with within a volume of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And that became kind of a, a norm, a standard, I would say. And meanwhile, because this CubeSat uh, um, a nomenclature caught on. If there are satellites out there with where you add like three cubes together, and it, that's called the triple cube. <clears throat> Going back to the Austrian uh, bright satellites, those are the two ones that we have raised money for and developed uh, partly in at the TOG in Graz. 
uh, and they are just before launch here in in <clears throat> in, in uh, at this uh, at the launch site in India, and they are twenty centimeter cubes, uh, still enclosed in their protective uh, kind of envelopes, uh, and you can see they are really small. Uh, the laptop to the to left to the side gives you a scale, um, a scale idea, uh, the idea of the scale for sure. Um, the complete list of the Bright nano satellites are, are given here. The two Austrians are UniBright and Bright Austria. In particular, Bright Austria was uh, um, tested, assembled, and 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 let's uh, and uh, and provided by the TUG Graz at Infelgasse. Uh, the location where I was uh, where I'm employed since 2015 now. Our Polish colleagues uh, also <clears throat> funded two bright satellites, one called Hevelius, one called LEM. And our Canadian uh, allies uh, also uh, provided two satellites. Uh, one is called Bright Toronto, one is called Bright Montreal. Uh, the launches, uh, the, the Austrian satellites launched first uh, in February 2013. In fact, that's now we're approaching the, the eighth year of launch, and that's um, and we're still operational uh, uh, in most part. Uh, so that means that we are running already quite for quite a while. Uh, space missions generally have a nominal lifetime that you have to. Uh, that you that you have to provide, or at least you, that you have to give or specify when before you create a mission, and uh, that's typical between two and four years. In our case, uh, the, the bright satellites were nominally to be operational um, for two years, and uh, as you can see from what, when we launched and what I just said, we're still operating most of them. We passed that uh, nominal lifetime by. A fourfold now when it comes to Pride Austria, for example, and that's quite uh, impressive because other missions with more money uh, invested have uh, had uh, shorter lifetimes. Uh, the one Canadian satellite that was very unfortunate, uh, both Canadian satellites were launched uh, in June 2014, among many other satellites uh, with uh, with a rocket, with a Russian rocket. And unfortunately, uh, the bright Montreal never separated from the upper stage and was never injected into a proper orbit, actually still stuck on an upper stage, which is flying around the Earth in a very elliptical orbit, um, never entered uh, the atmosphere or re-entered the atmosphere so far, but is now functional. From, it was not functional from the get-go. But at least we have, from the fleet of six, we were able to use utilize five of them. Uh, below here, you see a timeline of development, but I'll come back to that a little later. So missions, uh, space missions in general, what uh, what what drives the whole thing? I mean, what, how how you come with uh, come up with uh, an idea and then realize it? Well, always uh, first question is why. What's the, the general objective? What do you want to achieve? Uh, what kind of measurements <clears throat> to what kind of uh, quality you want to uh, collect, where to, and sometimes these are interrelated uh, questions and and, and, act, uh, and 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 things that you have to define. What kind of orbit you want to want to need or have to need you to launch into your your spacecraft into in order to achieve the measurements that you want to uh, collect. How? What kind of payload instrument that uh, or instruments, and what kind of spacecraft design or and ground segment design is needed? And uh, from the get-go, you should have a good idea what kind of risks are associated when you you know develop something for a lot of money and put in space, but when it things don't happen properly there, you never get your money back and you've lost a lot. And but with without risk, no fun, or in other words, no really good data, such as if we look at missions like TESS or Kepler, Kepler two or uh, Sun's uh, satellite. I mean, it's it's just impressive what kind of data collection we can get when things work. 
yeah, how long? As I said, uh, how long you want to conceive uh, developing a satellite and giving a primary cost estimate. This is, those are the basics, I mean, that you have to come up with, with your group of interested scientists, that uh, you have to at least have an, on top of an envelope idea in order to get further on and, and propose that to a funding agency. With the BRIGHT mission, again, why BRIGHT? Uh, scientific ob objectives, satellite design, mission operations, data collection, distributions. That is what I would like to convey to you over the course of this lecture. Why BRIGHT? Well, the idea was, the basic idea comes from the fact that space photometry or uh, photometry from uh, stars or in, in deeper space, uh, you know, started definitely with the Hubble mission and in, in before at a, at a high, high quality. And then uh, other missions came and other requirements uh, showed up. I mean, what was eventually really wanted to, we wanted to have is long, high quality photometry of certain objects that we select in the sky. And missions like, well, as I said, Hubble, then uh, like uh, like Kepler specifically, then looking for planets, but also measuring stars and so on. And even recently TESS and very active mission right now, they all have one thing in common. They're not very suitable for getting good photometry from the super brightest stars in the sky. Uh, stars with a magnitude, uh, equals uh, or lower four or six. Those um, objects usually tend to saturate the detector significantly when you apply reasonably uh, typical exposure times in terms of seconds or minutes. So those specific, those really bright objects were kind of left alone with not being uh, treated properly. And that was kind of the niche uh, we wanted to um, fill um, with the bright satellites. That's why they're so small. We actually have only, uh, you will see a little later, a very small telescopes that are only needed to get relatively good signal levels from the super bright stars. Uh, we wanted to have, um, uh, uh, at the one shot to get a sample of stars in a, in a relatively large field of view, uh, which is about 24, uh, square de uh, 24 degrees uh, diameter. And you wanna observe at least for 50 minutes each orbit uh, and collect data then. And we wanna do this uh, not only in one pass band, but in two, in a red and a blue filter. And the time base for those observations should be as if possible, as long as you can do that uh, in a in in a in a typical low Earth orbit uh, before the sun is e fading out of the field or coming into the field, so it's about a half a year. Typically, you have uh, time to collect such data. The data collection is specifically goes like this: we collect about let's say twenty minutes. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, we, we collect images over 20 minutes, uh, about 20 seconds apart, uh, and then uh, uh, reduce the data and get uh, brightness measurements and then string them together into a light curve and uh, that for a long period of time. So this is a typical structure of a bright data set. And we do this because we have pairs of satellite in two colors. Like one satellite is assigned to a, a specific color. It doesn't have multicolor or, or filter rot, uh, rotation in there. It just have one. It just has one filter. In this specific case, the blue measurements of a bright or a star in Orion, at the Orion, it's a complex multi-object uh, multi multi uh, system. Uh, it were done in the early phases of operation in to about uh, seven years ago. Um, in uh, in the, the blue measurements are from Bright Austria, 
and the red measurements are from Unibright, the red uh, twin of of uh, the Austrian brides. Back to system satellite systems architecture. What is it? What you need? No matter more or less if you have a twenty centimeter cube or something more or less something like a Hubble or a Kepler. What what is it? What everything every, everything has in common, and you can split that up pretty nicely into this um, into this uh, structure here. You need a ground segment because by all means you have to communicate with the spacecraft eventually uh, on on in terms of sending up co uh, control and commands and downloading data. You need, of course, that's the core. Something in space, the space segment, and of course, and for a very particular and very important uh, application, you need the launch segment. You need some someone to uh, uh, some system that launches you in the appropriate orbit, whether it's around the Earth or whether it's into space, uh, further into space. Uh, you have to have that system for that that covered. Uh, when you look at the space segment, then you have uh, a kind of a general division. You have kind of something what's often called housekeeping things, like things you have to take care of, for like communication, thermal, thermal control, maybe a propulsion system, uh, attitude control system, and so on. And then you have your instrument or payload. And payload element can consist of just one instrument. In the case of, right, it's just a telescope, a very small lens telescope. Uh, in the case of, uh, let's say, Hubble, you, Hubble is a Swiss Army knife. It has one optical kind of uh, um, <clears throat> big optics that serve eventually a number of different instruments. They're called payloads then. Uh, and each of the subsystems can have, again, sub-assemblies or assemblies that consist of units within them that build them up. Very often you see that very simplified uh, um, definition here, bus-related systems that take care of things and the payload. An instrument. On the left hand side, you see the Coro satellite. It's an interesting mission uh, that was running uh, to uh, collect uh, high precision photometry of uh, very bright stars, so solar type stars, and also to uh, probe and uh, search for exoplanets. It was a pretty successful mission, mainly funded by uh, the French uh, National uh, Science uh, Research. A space research agency and also with the contribution of ESA. But just as a, as a, as a typical example here, down here you see nice, uh, this is a bus. This is a bus that was used for other missions as well, uh, where, where you just, you know, essentially uh, mount something else on top of it, another payload. The space segment, what uh, does it really comes down to? The most important and commonly known um, uh, elements. Mechanical structure, obviously, you, move, you have something to put things into, and it should be stable. Not, not necessarily stable in space, but before you come into space, like transportation and, and so on. Anyway, then you need um, somewhere to get your power from, electrical power system, um, how the power is produced is the most in most cases it's uh, solar uh, solar cells uh, solar energy communication very important i mean not the, the prettiest the nicest satellite in space doesn't give you anything if you can't communi communicate with it attitude and orbit control very important thing uh, for most missions because you want to um, receive information from a specific segment in the sky. Even if you fly around the sun, you, you have to orient your instrumentation such that you can get what you want. And that needs uh, to control um, um, something that flies with generally high speed 
uh, through through you know through space, if it's around the Earth or somewhere uh, somewhere uh, a part of it, you have to control it somehow to the requirement to the to the quality to the specifications you have to have. Uh, data handling, you need to take care of the data on board. You have to shuffle it somewhere. You have to store it somewhere. You have to pre-process it somewhere, mostly. Uh, and then you have to make it ready for communication, for transfer to ground. Thermal control is often also a big issue, specific, specifically if you are flying instrumentations that are very susceptible to thermal thermal variations or high temperatures. I mean, anything done in the infrared or at, at uh, the cosmic wake by a uh, cosmic uh, uh, microwave background needs to be cooled extremely to extreme low temperatures, it needs to be kept there, it needs to be stabilized there. This could be extremely uh, sophisticated and, and complex and also expensive. And of course, then you have your, the payload, the instruments. Uh, Hubble Swiss Army Knife uh, has a lot of instruments, a huge uh, structure. Um, but still, I mean, if you break it down, you can break it down into this concept I've just shown you. More, going more smaller here. This, those, this is the structure of our bright nano satellites uh, 20 centimeter cubes, total mass of seven kilo. Don't don't get fooled. I mean, even though it's very small, it's relatively sophisticated and packed with instrumentation and gear uh, within this small volume. So it's it's just because it's small, it it's not it's not so simple. <laughs> uh, it has. Um, I will talk about the other sus subsystems uh, as we go along and 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 come back to what is needed for having a, a, a satellite in space. But uh, generally speaking, I mean, we are running this, this uh, which is also scaled to the mass and application. We are running the, the satellite with a peak power consumption of seven watts, which is really, really low. And with that, we can provide all basic functionality. The instrument, the, the instrument uh, is, uh, for the for both the red and the blue, it's just slightly different optical design. Three centimeter aperture, five lens system, uh, with a baffle in front that shields us from uh, some straight light from off angle sources. When you fly over the Earth by in, in about 800 kilometer height, the, the Earth is a brick big and uh, depending on what, which side you are on, a very shiny object, and so you wanna. You want to avoid uh, light coming in off, in off angles from from the Earth, and this is why a front baffle usually helps you to mitigate that issue. Uh, it also to helps you mitigate the, the issue that you occasionally have that, depending on where you observe in the sky, the moon will comes close to you or go through the field of view. Uh, those are the filters that we have set in uh, this or selected for the bright mission, the blue one uh, and the red one. Uh, we wanted to have that separate uh, as much as possible <clears throat> without going too sophisticated. Uh, one application, one science goal for uh, for the bright mission was to to do something called astroseismology. Uh, which means that uh, pulsating stars, uh, not necessarily the sun, but something like Delta Scuti stars and, and hotter stars that are pulsate, that if you can measure the pulsation in two uh, band, different band passes, then uh, the different behavior within, comparatively speaking, gives you an idea of what the geometric mode of the pulsation is, which is not a simple thing if you only have, uh, so to speak, only one filter measurements. Uh, we have a CCD, a very, at the time, very uh, available CCD, relatively simple. Uh, and it came also with uh, with the whole readout electronics already as a pack delivered by the then Kodak uh, company, which is now not any longer in the market. But uh, it at the time we selected the CCD, uh, it was uh, it seemed to have a 
been a good choice also because for many uh, CCDs that you want to operate in space at high performance, you need to have a cooling system. You need to cool it down to uh, at least temperatures of uh, minus 30, minus 40 degrees. And that we wanted to avoid simply because uh, uh, in, in our case, the temperature control and temperature system, the cooling system would have actually blown our budget. And so we wanted to find a solution, having a, a, a CCD that has low um, power consumption and uh, and low dark uh, dark signals um, at uh, at, high, at relatively modest temperatures. <laughs> you you would want to think that um, uh, in low Earth orbit, though already in space, of course uh, you have. Uh, you 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 may actually end up with a relatively low environmental temperature um, temperature um, level that you you have to endure with the satellite. But as a matter of fact, the typical temperature range uh, within this uh, our satellites are between zero and thirty degrees plus in space. Uh, so for that reason. Uh, uh, we wanted to have something that operates well at that level, essentially at room te temperature plus minus 10 degrees. Uh, the one thing that we, when we choose this, this CCD, we did not look too carefully about what the the, the radiation environment in uh, in space would actually do to it. And it, 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 I, I, can, I, I, I will not further dwell on that in that lecture, but we certainly have problems with that, and uh, the CCDs have been uh, progressively damaged due to radiation uh, degradation over the years we've used them in space. Uh, but the field of view, told you already, uh, it's uh, relatively large. It's the whole Orion would fit in. And as a matter of fact, uh, the first image we took was from Unibright, uh, the Red Austin satellite, and it actually uh, has what you see to the left brings the, the whole Orion nicely into onto the CCD. Uh, another view of that, uh, because the CCD is huge and we have very limited data rates that we can bring down to ground, we have to pick our stars uh, that for which we want to collect measurements, in fact. Um, and those are the brightest ones. That's what is our mantra, bright star explorer and um, set a few image heads around it, or rasters, I would call them, and only those data will be down, st extracted and uh, onboard and downloaded um, uh, to ground. This uh, is, was red image, also blue image from Iran, and this is, those are actually only the, in this case, uh, 15, the 15 uh, stars we have selected in that spe specific run that for which we wanted to collect uh, photometry. And th this is actually the data that we get once every 20 seconds and for about 15 plus minutes each orbit and over 180 days. Uh, when you look at the, the <clears throat> the, the stars, uh, the bright stars, this, this bright star distribution, or if you plot the bright, brightest stars, in this case of four, four and a half magnitude on the sky, and this kind of projection, this is what you, this is what you end up with. Uh, it's about, you will have about a thousand stars that are brighter than four and a half mag magnitude, a little less. And, uh, and yeah, we'll use, you see that our observing fields, and they are marked in here with different colors that we observed over the years, are essentially aligned along the galactic plane because they are the most bright stars that we can find at once. Uh, here is the Orion uh, uh, field that we have observed by now. We are still obs already observing for the eighth time in a row, uh, essentially every year, and the stars within. So that is one. One of our mission um, um, goals is that we can collect long time-based photometry, even with gaps of a, a half a year from uh, certain uh, selected stars, bright, super bright stars in, uh, in, in the sky. 
Uh, mission analysis that was already there, uh, why, what, where, and how. And I mean, the most important thing at all is this, you can come up with the nicest, uh, the nicest explanation why you need something and how you do it. Uh, but one of the most key things here is you have to find a funding agent, a funding agency, either it's NASA or ESA, which are mainly for really bigger missions that are beyond microsatellite level. And they go in the, in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions and beyond. Or as we have done it with the, in the Bright case, we look for just more or less a consortium of one or two, in our case, three countries that were potent enough in, in terms of having a space budget that would allow us to develop um, to develop and finally build and launch and operate such bright cubes that we have, you know, uh, succeeded to do. Uh, and this process, and this is a general thing, when you come up with a new concept, a new idea of a space mission, you have all of these things in mind. Of course, science has to be the driver. The science defines a payload to some degree. And the, and, and the science also tells you where you have to go to in, in, in what part of the space. Like we know that the low Earth orbit is one that is easy to access from many satellites. And we have so many there already, and we, it's getting more and more for Earth communications and Earth science and whatnot, and also for space. But the, the low Earth orbits <clears throat> are easy and relatively cheap to uh, to uh, to get into, but they don't they don't they are not the environment that, that you want to be in when you do other things. Like for example, I mean the, the, the next generation <laughs> space telescope. If I ever see this being launched, hopefully very soon, GWT will definitely not be launched in a low Earth orbit, of course. So uh, as far away from the Earth as possible. But then, if you're far away with a spacecraft from the Earth, means that you have per, per se uh, have to reserve quite a lot of power just to transfer the data over long distances and so on. So everything is uh, ground segment comes into the game then as well, because then you have to have huge dishes on ground to, to collect, uh, to receive the data and, uh, and the spacecraft design and, and so on. I mean, this, all those, those little pots here are interacted. The price is very important uh, to keep into mostly uh, the funding agencies, even the bigger ones, give you a sort of a limit uh, to to what you can aim to, and that everything needs to be optimized and compromised. This is what that this is what I wanted to convey to you uh, when you con you know consider being part of such a mission. Uh, you you a small mission usually relies on a, few, a small group of people. Uh, to decide, and that makes it easier. But then again, uh, you can't you, you can't expect uh, the super frontline science out of it. Everything comes comes with a cost, and the most expensive uh, certainly uh, hardware sometimes, but manpower. Uh, all missions go through phases. I mean, starting from the idea and layout and what you conceive of doing with it and, and the first cost estimates and so on. Uh, and these phases, the mission phases are kind of standardized uh, by ESA and NASA as a guideline and many uh, other smaller local domestic agencies uh, such as the French one or so kind of orientates their uh, you know, their scheme of letting something be developed um, towards those phase definitions. And it starts with the mission analysis. I mean, I've listed what's up there. Then, if you're lucky, usually when you have a mission analyzed, you compete already with, um, with something that's called, you know, it's a call for phase A studies by ESA for the next, this kind of size mission. And then you you get uh, 
five, ten, whatever uh, uh, kind of ideas already post-mission analysis or post-primary mission analysis and uh, and apply or a request for a funding, a so-called feasibility, feasibility called or phase A study. And there the competition already starts. Um, no matter whether you are in Europe or in, uh, in, in North America or often they collaborate, as you know. So after um, that, Rainer, yeah, uh, yeah, yes. a short question here um, uh, concerning phase A study and, and uh, teams or consortia that are then uh, kind of collected. Um, do you know um, who is uh, kind of initiating? Is it the uh, ESA? Um, I mean, where is the starting point? Uh, is it uh, a kind of a white paper that is written by a group of people and then ESA reacts? Or is it ESA that, uh, no. I mean, Egg, egg and hen uh, thing. Yeah, well, I mean, mo just before the mission analysis, what comes to, I mean, you, <laughs> Manu, you have been to many conferences, I'm sure you have been, uh, over the years, uh, and so have I. All the ideas come at the coffee uh, at the coffee meeting or at the conference dinner the or beer, after the beer, in the, or the beer right. after <laughs> this is uh, this is exactly it. what should we do next you know what what can we achieve if we would have this and then the the, the a nucleus of uh, interesting parties already kind of uh, emerge out of this totally informal you know chats some of them mm -hmm. never go anywhere but some really become more 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 um, you know more concise they, they, they are getting more focused and then very often they started to um, some of them yeah maybe the PI or the primary PI started to, well let me source you know let me see what ESA what the, the ESA program is coming up with in terms of opening for funding uh, in the next right, couple so, of but years it, it's not a it's not a right uh, a white paper so but it's a, a kind a of a one or two people that are contacting directly the, isa or or who have contacts uh, to well ESA you have to yeah you have to have a white paper in hand sorry to uh, mm -hmm. okay. the white paper should come out of this you know, informal, hey, let's put together some idea mm -hmm. um, right, based yeah. on this and that, then you should have a white paper. Without a white paper to to really attract uh, or being being kind of, you know, a real party to to ask for um, for being a client to or supported by ESA even maybe even before uh, even, even bef with uh, guiding uh, ESA have guiding you to, through the primary mission analysis there are kind of this is a gray area but a white paper mm -hmm. should, okay. should be in hand a pretty in hand, pretty okay. at the beginning uh, so what you generally want to achieve with a mission and what it generally be sized to and then mm -hmm. then you go uh, then you advance further but at that time when you come to this others have white paper too for you know this <laughs> half corner stone mission of this and that, and then you will compete for feasibility is, uh, for a phase A study uh, to be funded already by by um, by the, by such an agency or even a local uh, domestic agency or a consortium mm -hmm. of such. Uh, this, this is where it starts. And then the, right. after the feasibility study, I mean, or, or preliminary analysis, which is called NASA, NASA calls it that. Then again, you have to compete uh, because uh, uh, you have then three or four um, feasibility studies being funded towards one to be real funded mission, and then again you compete, uh, and then you. If you are selected, then phase B, C, D, E, F can follow. If you, if everything and, um, sets to properly, yeah. and in in terms of uh, timeline, so we're talking here about at least uh, <laughs> uh, so starting at zero is ten years, fifteen years, twenty yeah, years before yeah. launch. Or? Well, that depends so much on the size of the mission, so much. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, I, I I can't even conceive when uh, the next generation space telescope was started to be, when when the phase A study was there was for for NGSD as it was called then now it's GWT. I mean this was probably in the early 90s <laughs> okay, <fine. laughs> and we, but that's extreme case but this is why I wanted to come back to you in this particularly small satellite 
this nano satellite business started about 20 years ago where people well, the, the electronics the development of the technology was smartphones came uh, came up uh, uh, car electronics were rugged and and, and small and and very po uh, potent in terms of processing data all that of uh, brought together this idea uh, instead of having a satellite that has to have a few hundred kilos and have to have this and that in it, let's do it something, let's do it smaller uh, and do it faster. So in this particular case, I can tell you uh, what does fast mean? I mean, the, the idea or the kickoff of the bright, um, you see it here below uh, or um, at the bottom, started, the idea started in 2004. Uh, and the white paper was kind of put forward uh, in 2005, and then eventually the Austrian uh, the Austrian funding agency said, "Well, we are actually ready to fund the two Aus two Austrian satellites in 2006." Okay, 2006, and we launched in 2013. Okay. And uh, some of uh, so go through a, a preliminary design phase, then this has to be sanctified by your agency or by the review board. And they say, yeah, you can manufacture now, you can test and build the stuff. And then, with uh, especially with uh, small emissions, uh, you have to eventually wait for a launch for a while because you're not uh, being the primary uh, uh, pilot. So you have to, you know, fly like you fly Uber with somebody that, uh, you know, is, is the main payload and and, and you, it, uh, the, the launcher allows uh, uh, other secondary payloads. And uh, that's something that's, that's something that, that has to be factored in. You can, you can sometimes with small satellites being, de being developed within a year or two, but then wait three years for launch. All this, you know, is... <laughs> Has to be is is everything is more or less um, non-standard in a way because uh, the missions and the from mission to mission there are so many differences even though technically we think the type of measurements are, are similar like if you if you can uh, if you compare the Kepler mission to the test mission there are really a lot of similarities but if you look at the development and the timeline and so on. Uh, the politics involved, uh, Kepler had a much, much harder time to be, uh, get off ground um, than, than this. Uh, when you do and be part of, uh, yeah, and this is what I was wanted to say, is like, if you get into this kind of business and you're part of it, like, like I was, like, you know, kind of a, after my PhD, where, 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 what's next to go into hardcore science or more instrumental development? And I was lured in the track to, to a Canadian uh, 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 microsatellite space telescope mission called MOST in the late 90s. And then I stepped into that plate, onto this plate. And <laughs> that mission uh, kept me going for seven, uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, so you have to have patience. Really, when you start at the beginning, at really the, the concept white paper phase and hope everything goes through, you, you, you age with the, this, with the mission, even before you see the first data point uh, that I want to give you with. I mean, I'm already 57. I really know <laughs> I'm an old, uh, a pretty old guy among this group of uh, listening to my lecture, I think. Uh, yeah, this is the spacecraft project normal bitterness curve. And really, I've been through this now about three or four times. And uh, it just shows you that uh, you start with this super idealistic, yeah, let's do this, uh, we get funded and everything. And then things getting really critical and then you start hating everyone and, every, <laughs> and even yourself. And eventually, maybe everything settles down, and then you see the first light of this, and you're totally happy and hooray, and the champagne comes out. You've seen this, uh, I'm sure, at so many um, um, uh, those uh, uh, those uh, uh, documentaries about science missions, and specifically space, when you for a long time doesn't do not know what's going on with with your dear. Uh, gear. 
because you can't really physically access it anymore. Uh, let's go back to Bright. Um, what is what is Bright consists of then now? Top down uh, mechanical elements. Well, uh, generally speaking, you have to have a structure. The mass, as we've seen, because correlates with cost eventually, has to be as low as possible, but still stable. And mainly for transporting something from let's say, a clean room in uh, at the THG grass to the launch board um, or launch uh, assembly halls in Chennai in India. Uh, that you have to, even with a pro proper transport box and everything, that you have to, to survive without any damage. And then, of course, the launch. And for that, vibration testing is, is, is a, a requirement and such. <clears throat> Also, mechanical, mechanical structure also has initially, by design, immediately a thermal pro has certain thermal properties or can have some thermal properties that you need to be aware of. Usually, what you want to do, you want to keep the design in a model or kind of concept, makes everything easier and more uh, cheaper. And you have to also, even with the mechanical structure, you have to see what radiation does to it. Uh, yeah, well, the mechanical structure of the bright satellites are seen here. We have essentially the internal structure, uh, three, three different uh, uh, parts. The, the top part here is uh, kind of a panel, a pan, so to speak, with three onboard, three computer uh, boards in it. Then have we have the instrument bay. Um, and then we, at the lower end, we have other um, uh, we have other uh, uh, important gear uh, like uh, the reaction wheels and uh, the batteries and such. They are in, and they are assembled like this within. And then we have the six um, um, surface panels uh, in uh, all made out of uh, aluminum. Uh, the next system you have to have, no matter what is you need to get the power somewhere. Electrical power that is mostly meant. Uh, solar cells usually gets that, gives that to you, but of course they need to be efficient enough and uh, and plentiful enough in terms of area. Area means power. And uh, in our case, as you will see, then you need batteries to store the excess, excess power if you can and to release it when you don't have uh, uh, direct solar power and you have a, usually have a control system to keep the power under a certain, uh, certain within certain brackets uh, for all your subsystems or the electronic will, will go out of board. Uh, and the power budget over time needs to be considered right away. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna run uh, a mission for, let's say at least, uh, two years nominal in in uh, that means that you you have to have a sufficient redu um, overhead in uh, 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 solar power cell area that it really works with the degradation that is happening in space mainly due to radiation uh, in uh, over two years. Uh, typically, fortunately, this is uh, but most missions have. Have uh, have more way more power than the normal lifetime. In our case, we can vouch for that because, again, I mentioned two years normal power. Uh, normal normal lifetimes means power. We are in with Bright uh, Austria or Tuxat One. We are now approaching the eighth year of operation. That means we are we are still having enough power. So, in our case, we 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 have. You will see uh, design now quite often where you have unfolding power panel, uh, solar panels after launch. Uh, fortunately, we didn't need that complexity in our case. I mean, the the areas uh, of the six front panels, with the exception of the the one with the apertures here, are sufficient to give us enough power uh, for obviously in eight years now instead of uh, two. Um, then uh, solar cells, as I said, those are real pictures of the 
the satellites. By the way, <clears throat> one of the, this satellite, as far as I know, yeah, it's definitely took that one was actually tested in situ, so to speak, at the Loose Pill Observatory on the flat top. I was there a few nights, uh, and <laughs> we, we 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 didn't have any uh, any pointing uh, capability. We just set it there on a tripod, stable enough, and to get snapshot of the sky when it was clear with uh, the aperture here, which is the, the science, uh, the science um, um, that uh, our payload. And here, this aperture will come back to this later. Is for the Star Trek, which, which is also essentially an optical camera. Battery pack is in here. Uh, seen is one of in one of the in the lower pan, um, and it's uh, yeah, it's packed with stuff, and and, and it gives us uh, the power when we we don't we can't produce it directly from the sun. Uh, communication <laughs> again, nothing goes without communicating to ground. Um, how I'm doing with time? I'm kind of losing track a little bit. How much more time um, do I have? Left? The lecture is until forty-five. Oh, okay, not too bad. So the lecture takes until forty-five. So in the next uh, twenty-five minutes, but uh, maybe we reserve. Yeah, time yeah, time that, for that, that, that should work well. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, ground to satellite, satellite to ground. Obviously, one thing is um, very important. You have to set yourself onto and commit yourself to transmission frequencies that actually have to be nominated. Uh, and and, and and you have to request those to be assigned to you by an international, uh, uh, by UN, uh, by UN, uh, UN agency. Uh, and so not, not everyone does that, which is a uh, uh, bit of a drag. Data rates, uh, you have to be very realistic what with your power of, you, you're sending data to ground. So that means that and those are core data. I mean, this is really the one thing. Those are your products. You know, those are, those are not co commands with a few bytes. Those are really the beef of it. Um, and you want to make this most efficiently uh, by all means. So you have to be really realistic how much data you can bring to ground um, on, a, on a daily basis or on whenever you fly over a ground station. Um, and that has to do with the frequency and uh, the, the transmission uh, energy that you can provide on board. Data rates are associated to that, and the transmission time budget you have to be aware of. How long, how often do I get to transmit data to ground um, uh, with a specific setup, uh, and that limits your download uh, data budget of course very tightly and you have to also consider interference sources i mean if you have a ground station close or in within uh, uh and that's quite often the case uh, such as uh, the dog and the infocasa in a in a inner orbital uh, urban area you have to uh, consider a lot of uh, at least at low uh, inclination angles uh, quite a lot of interference noise from from other businesses mobile for example yeah i mean here we have this there you see this patch uh, s-band antenna we we are actually transmitting uh, data down to ground in the gigahertz gigahertz um, domain uh, assigned to us legally and we have uh, for the upload we only actually need uhf uh, uh, um, uh, capabilities because Typically, we only uh, upload some commands to the onboard computing system, and those are not having a lot of volume in terms of data 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 rate. Fortunately, uh, those are in con concretely those are the just the hardware to what I'm just uh, to showed you internally. <laughs> uh, Another most important uh, element for definitely uh, um, sp space astronomy missions is how good can you orient and how stable can you orient your payload, your instrument, or the whole satellite um, to a certain location in the sky that you select to collect data from. 
And in order to get an idea where you are actually orientating yourself at any time, uh, even before you stabilize your motion in, in space, you have to have sensors that give you an idea where you are. Uh, and then you have to, in, uh, then you have to uh, reactors that you actually use to stabilize yourself. And in this case, is the we have sun sensors, which actually give uh, uh, give you an idea in which orientation this, in our case, the, this part, this our our a cube is uh, oriented towards the sun. Uh, magnetometers are giving us an, a similar uh, idea, but it's actually more towards where where are we oriented towards the Earth magnetic field. Uh, when we eventually um, start um, the Star Tracker, then we get instant images from from the area where we're looking at with our instrument, which is you know, aligned to it, so to speak. But in order to actually get yourself into a, a quiescent enough movement uh, in space, because nothing there, you know, there is no windshield thingy. There is nothing that breaks you down if you if you are in motion, unless you have something that can do that. And magneto torques can do that quite well because of the Earth magnetic field. Uh, and uh, reaction wheels eventually give you the the chance to to smooth that uh, that motion down so that you, the star tracker takes unsmeared images and can identify where you're looking at and then the whole thing starts with uh, science observations when you are fine pointing onto a certain orientation this is um, orbit control uh, this is attitude control within an orbit some more sophisticated, more sophisticated uh, missions do have a, an additional means to by actually controlling or changing the orbit itself we can't do that with uh, right for that you need generally thrusters with uh, you know some limited budget of uh, uh, thrusting uh, medium and of course, you need, with all that, a relatively sophisticated control of hardware and software uh, interacting with each other and accessing information from all those things such that you, even though you're flying 7,000 kilometers per hour around the Earth, you, you're very uh, stably uh, just looking in one direction, at least for 15 to 20 minutes per, per segment. And for that, uh, we have uh, sun sensors, reaction wheels. Um, we have this star tracker here. This is the second, uh, second uh, optical, uh, the second camera here. Uh, th this is really an important thing. And magneto torque, uh, magneto, uh, magneto torques are actually just coils that can be controlled pr properly that are within these panels, the side panels, and the magnetometer, which actually measures the local magnetic field strengths and orientation, is, is kind of, you know, offset a little bit from the structure in order to avoid interference with other magnetic uh, source uh, electronics in here. Uh, just a little more uh, clearer picture on how the assembly is within uh, within uh, the instrument bay uh, and absent the, 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 the front panels. The telescope, our payload, and the Star Trek, a much smaller uh, unit that gives us um, every second, essentially, when it operates, uh, an idea where we look at. And uh, because we want to have an orientation, we give an orientation where we look at. Star Trek tells us, are we looking there? And if not, uh, we want to control the whole motion of the satellite such that we are getting there. Of course, this is a process that is in a loop and has a certain smear function to it, but uh, we can achieve the pointing accuracy or stability that we need uh, even with the small masses, and that's good. Otherwise, we couldn't have done this mission by any means with success. Just what I said, I mean, you need over the exposure time, which is set usually between one and five seconds, an image that's essentially stable onto the same amount, same pixels on the CCD and nothing like that, a smeared 
um, smeared image uh, and has uh, and the smearing is definitely different uh, on the next exposure. Uh, for, uh, one of the most important uh, key elements to keep yourself stable in, in such an orbit and such a system are those miniature reaction wheels. You have them uh, controlled properly uh, and for, with those mounted in relatively in a three axis um, configuration gives you three axis stability. If you also have it under control <laughs> and those attitude control system engineers though this is a, this is a, a subclass of space uh, engineers that are very 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 important um, this is a, a picture of the pointing performance in pixels uh, plus minus um, RMS um, this, those are the RMS uh, area uh, circles. Uh, and we want it to be somewhere within this orange circle as a minimum requirement. We have our some of our space, some of our satellites have uh, different star trackers. Uh, the Austrians have an older model from another company uh, that was at the time selected because it would fulfill our requirements, which it does. Uh, but subsequently, uh, a better one was selected. For the for the satellites that were launched later, and, and built later, uh, the Polish and the uh, and the Canadian satellites and the pointing performance is better, mainly because they have a better sensor, better Star Trek. Thermal control uh, mentioned also uh, temperature sensors we have for Bright. We have no cooling system. System we have not really a heating system. We have some isolation. We want to isolate, for example, the battery back from from other systems such that they never get too cold or never get too hot. Um, it's not really controlled, but uh, it's keeping within a bracket or a limit of temperatures. There are passive and active systems and other uh, satellites. Uh, we have only very passive system, uh, um, but other more sophisticated sophisticated missions uh, have certainly a system to cool the um, focal plane and sometimes even the whole uh, optical um, array to a, 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 a given temperature in order to avoid uh, uh, systematic errors in, in the measurements. Uh, yeah, not we don't have much here. Uh, hardware, software, data management, data storage, data transfer. We have three computers in this small box uh, included. Uh, So-called payload computer that only takes care of the instrument, of the telescope. Uh, an attitude control uh, computer that really is mainly uh, does all the computing and the tasks associated with orienting the spacecraft to its nominal position that we give it, that we that we uh, select. Uh, and a housekeeping computer that keeps takes care of the, mainly the rest, which is the power control, uh, the communication with ground, um, <clears throat> and the data man uh, and data storage, uh, and so and such. Uh, the cool thing is, I mean, usually in the nano satellite business, it starts at the mic micro satellite level already. But at the nano satellite level, usually you don't have much redundancies. But in this case, uh, and we have learned that the hard way, because we had one issue with an attitude now with the payload computer on uh, Bright Austria, the one that was uh, developed and built in in, in, in a GOG eventually, and we could actually make the housekeeping computer take over uh, the functions of the the payload computer and still uh, the system works uh, well enough without any without any other limitations um, that helped us a lot uh, a while ago but this is yeah I'm just saying that um, redundancy, redundancies are often a big issue with bigger uh, more sophisticated missions and there there are there's a good reason for having that. Uh, I'm only say, I mean, I only only mentioning the Kepler mission with the reaction wheel there. I mean, they, in hindsight, would have loved to have even more redundancy when it comes to reaction wheels. Uh, when you do the set, develop the satellite, uh, when you're actually building stuff, once you start building stuff, uh, you are already have to test them individually as subsystems or even just components. 
uh, and you, you go through a whole test procedure that is required usually by the funding agencies or at least the launcher uh, to say, well, when we, if we launch you, we make sure that you're just not r rattling apart and maybe damage other you know, clients uh, while doing this. So you have to uh, follow a, a relatively strict protocol uh, and it's also good for you for, for your own uh, uh, risk assessment or risk mitigation to make sure that you you work under vibration, under shock, under thermal uh, stress, various temperatures, under radiation uh, with sources being um, uh, emitted to uh, critical components and also whether or not you're facing electromagnetic interference within your systems that you're running in parallel, different clock speeds and such. All that you have to test on a component, a subsystem, and then in a complete assembly level, uh, which only by if you pass all of that, you can say, here is my flight ready uh, satellite, and please let me launch it somewhere. And for that, this is a, a tedious, time intensive, and often very cost intensive task to get all through those tests because not many of the specifically the nanosat uh, nano satellite developers have the the test the chambers the test chambers or the vibration tables in house uh, so you have to you know outsource that and that comes with a lot of you know overhead and costs and risks as well just want to mention that. Uh, to the, here is um, one of the set of, one of the bright satellites being extremely abused in the thermal chamber, or at least before or after uh, um, it is closed. Here it is uh, in the confinement, uh, which really mounts the satellite to the uh, to the upper stage of the rocket or the release stage, and uh, and keeps the satellite attached to that structure uh, as long as this door opens on command and then the satellite is released by uh, in this case by just a, a spring preloaded spring force into orbit one other thing that you may hear if you go into this whole business eventually is that all satellites um, really all of them uh, big or small have somehow a flat set somewhere on ground in a lab, at least for a while. And while it's not in its shape and in its uh, structural confinement, obviously, this one is very useful when you start developing subsystems on an engineering level, then uh, upgrading it to, uh, to space flight level, great, and, and, and so on. But even after that, you keep this flat side uh, on ground operational because if you want to check out new software, specifically software that you want to or need to uh, update or change in order to overcome certain issues uh, that emerge, uh, because this one uh, is res this part is radiation damaged and can't be used anymore. You you go back to your flat side in the lab and test out that uh, that code uh, very tediously and before you upload it to space. We launched the Austin we, the the six satellites of Bright launched and five four different uh, launched and uh, four yeah four uh, the Austins in India the two. Polish ones, uh, one, the first one in Russia, the second one in China, and the two Canadian ones also in Russia. This is uh, the, the Indian uh, rocket that was just assembled before launching um, not only the two Austin satellites, but uh, 12 others uh, from other countries mainly as well. We were launching a low Earth polar orbit, uh, the Austrians were. Uh, we're flying over the poles uh, in an 800 kilometer height. That's our, our, the others are a little lower. Uh, when you see where they are at once at some point in time, it's already 
Wow, this is a long time ago. <laughs> this is uh, the, in mid-September 2014. The situation was as such. The, the satellite Unibright was here. Bright Toronto was there. Uh, Bright Austria was just uh, flying over uh, the north, almost the North Pole. Uh, we have three ground stations to essentially servicing the three, uh, the three, uh, um, the, 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 the three couple of satellites um, with a uh, Canadian one, it's only one. Uh, but we can use them for also getting data up or down uh, with the other satellites. This is um, these are pictures from the ground station at the TOG and the Infocasa in Graz. Uh, very nice uh, and uh, uh, room to control the two satellites. And uh, just a few meters above for the flat roof is the antenna that uh, the power ball um, uh, if it is for receiving data and uh, the Yagi antenna to the left is the UHF uplink. I don't want to uh, spare you the details of what the ground stations really all kind of need to do, uh, except for for a, a ground station and an, an orbit that we have for the bright satellites, uh, and specifically the Austin satellites, we get, um, we get uh, essentially contact each day about three 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 times in the morning or three times in the evening um you have a, a flyover of the satellite and you have to you have to adjust the antenna to pick it up somewhere where it's supposed to come up and then uh you have about at maximum 50 minute time to receive or, or upload data from the spacecraft during such an orbit. So that's one thing you have to consider. And with all of that, uh, we get, uh, with the whole thing, with the, the number of orbits that, uh, or the passes that we have each day, we get about 16 to 20 megabytes down on the core science data per day, which is really a relatively modest data rate. But can be sustained with a gear. Um, this is all based on amateur satellite op operators uh, technology that was uh, essentially conceptually designed in the 70s and 80s of last century, but can be um, can be bought with a few tens of thousands of euros instead of super professional, high reliability ground stations where just a few hours of operations costs a few thousand euros. So when you when you go small with the satellites, you also have to go small with other systems. Uh, that's but you know if if it works within with within the realm of what you want to achieve, then uh, it, it it works and uh, it does for pride for sure. There is a lot of things going on in terms of observing observational planning. I think I'm pretty much coming to my to the end of uh, the time I have before questions. Is that true? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I mean, um, I think if we have ten minutes for questions, we can plan to. Have okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, everything needs to be planned, when to observe a field, uh, during which part of the orbit. This is all done by the operators. One thing I wanted to show briefly, if it's a very busy slide, uh, how do we operate? We have a science team that essentially gives the, the scientific pro, um, uh, um, sets it to, into, into place for the next 12 months, which fields, which stars should be observed. Uh, and it kind of hands this over to the mission control, which is essentially me. Uh, and I digest that, and if what they want is not feasible based on experience or other issues, I tell them, and then they refine that. And if the the, the program is set, then I instruct the the uh, satellite operations team. We have one in, in in Graz, one in Toronto, and one in Poland to to assign their satellites to this and that kind of observations. Uh, every day I have access to data from those satellites on an FTP server and I do look at those essentially once or twice each week at least uh, to see whether we are doing fine, uh, whether everything is as we expect 
connected and if not then i interact with the operators and tell them oh, there's something going on can you check this and can you check that and uh, so that we can find a solution for it um mostly we find uh some way and then uh the raw data comes back to me the, the combined raw data of an observing run lasting for like five to six months put is then put into um, a reduction pipeline that is run and developed or run by one uh, super nice uh, colleague in Poland that uh, gives me back the reduced data, like image data reduced into time versus signal data, light curves. And uh, I and I essentially reformat those light curves and send it back to the clients or best and to all the people that wanted to, those observ observations to be done. Um, well, wrong direction, sorry. Uh, briefly, yeah, it's just what I said, you you have raw data, uh, and then you have fits images, and eventually you have uh, photometric data that, uh, yeah, for for various kind of stars that you have selected. Uh, at this point, I this is essentially also something. This you know I went very casually through this, um, but. And I know for a fact that uh, quite a number of people be listening now are still listening, I hope, uh, you know, have dealt with uh, data from space missions such as, let's say, TESS or Kepler or Kepler-2. And uh, they come out and eventually you get them and you work on them and to do your whatever analysis for whatever reasons with it. But the data you get are already pre-produced even after, even if the mission works quite well, and you don't have an issue with like a radiation damage CCD that we have, which gives us more complexity um, uh, in terms of getting the data reduced properly. But nevertheless, there are often systematic, systematic issues uh, that you see when you just look at the raw data, even if, if it already reduced, like, extracted from image to a single magnitude value, for example. You have lots of outliers, you may have trends, you may have correlations between signal level and the temperature of the CCD, which we certainly have with Bright, because we don't control the uh, temperature of the CCD, and it swings by a few de degree each orbit while we observe, and over over uh, the course of six months, it can swing by by 15, 20 degrees. So we have to, you have to keep this in mind, and, and before you actually use the data, uh, for a scientific analysis, you have to look at, you have to check out these potential correlations, and if they're there, you have to find a way to rectify it. We have the bright science team and members of, uh, of us have spent a lot of time figuring out how to do this best. We have a way and mean to decorrelate the data, um, and uh, by now that helps us to use the best possible data under all, all circumstances. But even if you use uh, test data, be aware of that this, those things have happened. Either not yet totally, because you still see some some trending in there, then you may have to look for for sources where the, whether you do your own decorrelation or own, own detrending, or you find a um, uh, repository where this is already done uh, in a good and consistent way. This is one thing I, uh, uh, Paul, uh, we talked about. Uh, we want to make this slide or at least bring this up to, for awareness. The data not always come out as clean and soft and nice from the instrument as they appear then on your screen when you start your analysis. Where you get information about bright observations, we have a wiki page, which essentially gives you all, we provide you all kinds of information what we already did in the past and what we're doing uh, right now, uh, which fields we are observing and usually also which stars in, 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 this, in those fields we are observing right now or, or in the past. And we have uh, a link there. I mean, here you can, when once you get, you can just go and search there. There is no password protection on it. You don't even have to 
Rich is the is a user there, and uh, you can also go to the public archive straight there because many of our light curves by now are public domain. Uh, not all of them are properly decorrelated, but if if you are interested in in data in the public data archive, you go we yeah, end up there. Uh, then uh, you you can uh, if you need further information, you can ask me uh, for sure uh, to help you with getting the best possible data set that we have or at least can produce for a certain star. Uh, here also going back to the front page of the wiki site, uh, a little further down than sorry than what what I have. Uh, screen cropped here is a, a total list of stars that we have observed individually listed and also when uh, how often do, did we observe those stars this is um, this is certainly something you should look at if you are really interested in uh, our data products and essentially well that's yeah, that's a summary uh, so far we have been operating bright constellation uh, since february 2013 uh, after launch, usually I haven't, I haven't uh, mentioned that uh, in my lecture yet, but I can do it right now. After launch, I mean, you cannot expect that you get data right away. Usually there is a so-called commissioning phase. And this commissioning phase is really essentially something that's because most of those things have are unique uh, systems, haven't been flown before in uh, um, in 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 uh, in any other way. So so you have to start testing out your subsystems, which are essentially a one-off, and you cannot test out, for example, three day three D axis uh, three axis stabilization on ground due to the you know gravity environment. So these kind of things especially checking out, testing out the pointing control system uh, takes an uh, extensive period of time. And uh, so you can expect easily to spend six months on just getting yourself started um, to, to get to collect the first really scientifically useful data on almost an average mission, even the, the, the bigger missions. Well, bigger missions have also the challenges that they have more payloads to be checked out and, and such. So that uh, that commissioning phase can last easily as long as a year, um, but six months is a minimum. Uh, and uh, you have to factor this in at the proposal level and all the development you know, uh, proposal levels that uh, you just do not start operating scientifically at uh, hour one after the release in, in space. Uh, we have uh, five satellites. So one is really having a problem now and probably has to be decommissioned, which is also something that needs to be taken case with uh, satellites formally doesn't operate anymore. It should be decommissioned, put into a stage where it doesn't uh, op doesn't run any system on board anymore, and uh, it should also be flagged as such by the by the registry, the International Satellite Registry, to say this is now decommissioned. It doesn't operate anymore. It's essentially space junk, as so many are. Uh, so we have four essentially still operating. Uh, we have thus far observed. Uh, uh, photometry from more than 700 stars in uh, about 60 campaigns that we are running uh, and uh, millions and millions of image, images collected. Data reduction decorrelation is a complex and labor intensive task. Uh, so if you are more specifically interested in getting our data products, um, it may need more than just going to the public data archive, but I may be the liaison to, to lead you further. Uh, hopefully, at least some of the satellites <laughs> will will observe for uh, one or two more years, and that's where I I, I end here. And uh, thank you very much for having me. I hope I gave you a little bit of a uh, whatever juice for what it's needed to to work on a, a space mission. 
thank you, Rainer. That was really a very, a very great insight into uh, satellite operations, and also especially for for the students uh, to to uh, make them aware of um, um, data quality and uh, and reduction processes and how important uh, those processes actually are um, before starting uh, working um, or yeah. before starting thinking about the scientific work. So that's. Uh, I uh, think that's a very, very great exercise. Um, so students, uh, I know the uh, time is uh, is quite, uh, so we are almost, I mean, we are at the end, but uh, maybe there are a few questions that you would like to, to ask uh, to Rainer. Uh, 